All right, I think every, everybody can see you now. Um, like I said, um, ask your questions. Every question is welcome. I'll just, to get the conversation going, I'll ask the first question. So in, in your view, and that's a question to everybody, in your view, what are the major unanswered questions, million dollar, billion dollar questions in the field of genomics? And is there any technology that doesn't exist today that we are desperately missing to answer these questions? Uh, actually, yeah, so make sure you have microphone. Hi, hi. Right, yeah, okay, microphone. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> Whoever wants to start, in no particular order. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um. Yeah. No. So I think. Um. Um. Let me see, John. That's a bit cool. Uh, I mean, I. I think. I mean. I mean, Gary kind of brought it up, actually. Um is um uh, and again th this speaks to kind of your work as well Vidim, in terms of integrating dynamics actually uh in live cells kind of with high resolution structure and function right um is that you know we have these kind of uh genomics basically where it's sort of you know uh sort of global population views of everything uh, at, but uh none of them are kind of connected so we can measure individual things sort of at a population level often but then how do we connect that back to individual cell behaviors, basically, and the dynamics of them, right, where no two structures might be the same, right, which is a very different way of thinking about structure, right, as why comes I want to impose the three-dimensional structure on top of the three-dimensional structure. But I think the lesson might be that they're statistically repeating sort of in a dynamic way where there might be on average certain contacts that give you sort of this kind of uh, uh, critical phenomenon, et cetera, needed by different factors. And that gives you robustness as well as variety, right? And so, so, so I think what, what we what we really need is sort of, and again, um, I think the team uh, sort of can speak to this is in terms of building multi-scale maps sort of of cells and, and cell fate is, is a single technology that could actually sort of um, ideally um, enable us to measure, you know, transient dynamic interactions and actually sort of memorialize them in a cell, right? So we could find them after by mass spec in an ideal world by genomics, right? So we could see them and then even begin to sort of um, um, sort of combine that with actually then kind of visualizing the structure. That, that would really give us, I think, kind of structure to function, uh, uh, um, uh, to sort of um, phenotype. And, you know, I think this is the power, I guess, of genetics, and, you, and I'll hand it over to you, is that I think the, the issue with imaging, to be fair, right? Again, the, 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 weak, the weakness of imaging <laughs> and the power of genomics, uh, of their both uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, opposite of each other, is that the, the issue with a lot of imaging experiments is we kind of have two or three colors and we only label what we know. We don't see what we don't know. So they kind of become self-fulfilling prophecies. So we, you know, so, so how do we sort of uh, look at, you know, uh, can we develop, develop things that detect phase detectors and begin to proximity label them, right? And actually uh, that same technology in genomics and, and kind of imaging, right? I think, that, I think that's a huge gap. And the same technology that allows us to integrate genomics, right? Uh, single cell population. That's kind of my ideal dream, right? This kind of multi scale. No, I, it, it's hard to add to that because I think that's exactly, uh, I agree completely that, you know, and, and I think that that's the big challenge is in vivo, it's very difficult to deconvolve the, the multitude of interactions that are occurring in time and space. And, and you know, really, you said it beautifully. I mean, the, the technology is not there. There's absolutely no question that that we, we can't do that type of thing yet. Um, I think we're making advances. Um, two things that I would add, and and I'll preface this by saying I don't do math. Um, unlike many of you, I'm not a physicist. My older sister is a solar physicist, but none of that got you know <laughs> none of that got transmitted to me. But I, you know, I've over certainly the last 10 years have come to really appreciate the value of integrating physics and physics theory into the biology. This is not easy <laughs> from both sides. Um, I mean, some people like John and Andy can do both, um, um, but you know, it's, it involves finding the right collaborators. I'm very lucky, Sam Safran, Daniel Joes, Frank Ulicker, people who can speak to dumb biologists like me um, and, and, and 
you know, get the conceptual component across without necessarily having the math. Um, so, and that, you know, it, it is very challenging, but I think we need, we need the technology, we need the theory and we need to iterate, um, especially with live systems um, in order to gain a better understanding. The other part of this is, and this is gonna sound like the old curmudgeon that I am. Um, <laughs> yes, 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 I'm sorry. But, but I think we need a, a real fundamental change in, in perspective. And, and what I mean by this is in the nuclear organization and chromatin field, there is still, in my view, an overemphasis on you know, high throughput, large data set uh, types of approaches, which are extremely useful. Do not get me wrong. <laughs> They're extremely useful, but they become an end to themselves. And that and and in a way that is not as informative about the basic biology as it should be. And so the absent, if you do the pure computational genomic analyses, to see, cut and tag, high C, et cetera, et cetera, without doing the imaging, <laughs> without doing the physics, you're missing a huge boat. And the problem, as I see it, is that it's very attractive to generate tons of data. <laughs> And it gets you published in wonderful journals, but it's not telling you, in my view, what you I'm need thinking. to, oh, to sorry. understand the biology. Oh, that <laughs> That's funny. Well, thank you. So, so I, I think what you're saying is that we need something like you know, Maxwell equation for the electricity, right? We, we're, we're not generating data on gazillion electrons. We just know how things work, right? Yeah. and get to the basis of it. Yeah, I think I mean, you wanna, there, there's incredible use to, to those approaches, absolutely, and we learn a lot, but, but I think we can't view that as, as the end. The end is understanding the biology, and, and that requires much more integration. And I think that's one of the beautiful things about your work is, is the integration of not only multiple scales, but multiple approaches. The more orthogonal approaches we can take, the more we can learn. Um, so, and uh, so on, oh, sorry. Um, sorry. I, I guess just one other thing I would add is that, you know, I do think as well, right, you know, modeling again, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down, I, mean, I, thought, I thought that was beautiful in terms of predicting sort of, you know, what these molecules might be like, right? What are the scaling laws, right? And so, so one challenge I would say to you, to you is that, you know, again, um, uh, design is the ultimate test of understanding. You're an engineering school, right? Um, as by, you know, evolution is sort of blind, right? And you can discover kind of principles, but seriously, right? There are actually certain principles now that are emerging, right? In terms of amphiphilic sorts you know, is it sort of small repeats? Is it basically a ligamorization, right? And so, uh, you know, what would be the device that you would build to change the genome and to create entirely new cell states, right? That's sort of, I think, the ultimate challenge to understanding. And that's where we could bring it. Imagine if we could design completely new things, right? And I actually think that, some of those principles are there now. And so it needs a combination of synthetic biology. What is nature made? But it doesn't explore to endless possibilities, right? What is the device that you would make? Um, and can we basically sort of use them to integrate into these systems and reimagine them? Because if you can build it, you understand it. And so I think that there's also a need sort of for coming kind of from top down and bottom up. And they have great utility as well for medicine. Very good, very interesting. I just, uh, I see the question, just I think Son, you wanted to add a few words, right, as well. Oh, yeah, I, I want to echo what uh, Dr. O'Shea and Dr. Carbon said. Um, I, I agree that uh, the integration of uh, the uh, molecular level, high level, uh, high resolution imaging together with genomic uh, analysis will be very uh, uh, helpful. And, and in addition, I want I would say that they uh, agree that uh, the really interdisciplinary approaches to address this will be necessary because uh, I think uh, you know sometimes you need a hypothesis to test in in an idea out of box could uh, um, could uh, give more insight and give some direction for exploration. Oh, very interesting. Thank you. So let's just take questions from the audience. Yes. Yeah, so. I, I had a follow-up um, question, which is kind of related to you know, how do you how do you build up an understanding 
of these sort of multivalent interactions that are, you know, there's all these different players and they're all, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of struck by on the one hand, there's a philosophical approach, you know, like take as an example, like, you know, Gita Narlikar did these, you know, very nice kind of binding assay, you know, studies of, you know, mononucleosome, dinucleosome, throw in, I guess this was sweet six, but like, you know, like HP1 analogs, and then you get number, right? But of course that gets exhaustively complicated if you're talking about, you know, all these possible, you know, compensatory effects. And, you know, you had a really nice example of different phenotypes that emerge by taking out one protein player and then it totally shifts you know, the, the organization. And I guess from your viewpoint, is it, how, how do you approach that problem? I mean, is it a matter of, of doing the in vivo knockdowns and seeing different phenotypes and then saying, oh, what must be the sort of hierarchy of interactions? Or do you think that there's a lot of value in that bottom up sort of approach where you're literally trying to take each individual player and figure out what those interactions would be? Is that a clear enough question? Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a great question. Thank you. I, I'll start. Um, I mean, it, it's essentially what we were talking about before. I think, you know, each of these approaches has value and provides information. So in the case of you know, Gita's beautiful work on SWI6, um, the biochemistry, at least in my view, the biochemistry in vitro, as for the, the coarse grain modeling and other types of, of of, of modeling based on the basic physics tells you what's possible in vivo, <laughs> but doesn't actually tell you that it's happening in vivo. And, and so again, back to iterating between the, those two components and others and what you see in vivo and the genetics and the genomics, I think is the way to go, but it's, it's, um, it's got its limits. Um, you know, I mean, the point, one of the points I was making is you get rid of this factor or you get rid of even, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of work now on, I get rid of this disordered domain in a protein and I see, you know, a phenotype, I get rid of that disordered domain and in vitro, I see that alters phase separation. Therefore, phase separation regulates this process in vivo. No, <laughs> we can't make, I mean, it's possible, but we can't really make that leap because we don't know what else is happening. And, um, you know, but I think our best approach is to be combining all of this. In my own lab, we're trying to do the in vitro chromatin assembly, a la Mike Rosen, combine it with HP1 and, and answer basic questions about energetics and kinetics at that level, and then integrate that with the theory and use that to inform us about the experiments we should do in vivo. But so I, I really don't have a good answer. I'll just add one other thing, which is that um, what we have found to be useful is gain of function mutations rather than solely loss of function mutations. So the problem with loss of function is, you know, I get rid of a chromo domain I didn't go into this in detail. If we get rid of any of those interactions, these multivalent interactions for HP1, dimerization, chromodomain interaction with chromatin, interaction with binding partners, reduce the levels of binding partners, we dissolve or severely affect the, the condensate, right? But the problem is you can't say that, that let's say the phenotypic consequences of that are because you lost the condensate. Um, whereas when you change the material properties by increasing affinities as one version of gain of function, then you know, you have at least another tool in your, and so if, for example, in that case, we can make more solid HP1 condensates that now have phenotypic consequence. It's still difficult to interpret that, but it is at least another approach. So yeah, I, I, I think what you've highlighted is, is the big problem. And I really, I mean, I'd love to hear other solutions, but I don't see anything other than just combining all of these tools that we have in a way that is integrative and in, and thus more informative than each of them. Yeah, I mean, I think basically, uh, I think I think what, what what Gary said was was exactly thing. I I think I have just one maybe one thing to add is that I think one thing to think about is that you know um, proteins and nucleus are there fundamentally to regulate the DNA, right? And again. 
and thinking about sort of a chromatin polymer, which in itself, as part of a chromosome, doesn't really, you know, it has it has much more constraints on potentially its relative movements and potentially its interactions with the lamina, nuclear volume, right? Basically, osmotic potential ions, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, all of these kind of different things, right? Will change concentration, right? Basically, local concentration. But also that polymer, right, is going to be sort of much more stable. So again, what's the size of the domain, right? You know, 300 nanometers, where things begin to operate. Because I think we've witnessed kind of a lot of these high C where people are are shocked that they get rid of CT CF side and nothing that nothing happens. I'm not shocked at all, right? <laughs> because it's part of one interaction, and maybe on a weak regulated gene, uh, that could be an important interaction. But when you have stronger interactions that drive it, it's it's less important. Right? So so again, it's an integral model of many different factors that together, right, in terms of a signal response, right, I'm building a device that now we can't anticipate, you know, sort of uh, an asteroid or, or an unknown stress, right? So we build devices that can potentially respond to different signals that could be integrated to give rise fundamentally for selection. That's the, the only drive that we have, right? And so that's a really interesting idea about, again, critical phenomenon, right? Is that multivalent interactions are part of a critical phenomenon. And in some cases, they may be the critical phenomenon, but in other cases, you know, a high affinity transcription factor binding site is the critical thing, right? And so, so, so again, I, I think it's about sort of that inherent flexibility in biology, right? Because it's amazing to think you can mutate something and survive and get away with it, right? And yet, you know, it can give variation and yet complete robustness, right? That I think is really what's interesting about valency, right? Where you don't have to have five every time. It doesn't have to be 13, it doesn't have to be 70. And it can be combined with other things to push something over um, kind of the top, right? Um, and this is again, where I think repeats of DNA, right? May have completely different constraints as a polymer. They're less diffusible as well, basically, right? It, it's, it's really sort of almost semi-solid if you think about it in a packed nucleus, right? You know, it's, it's a totally different, not, it's, not, it's not diffusing, right? You know, the polymer is really moving as maybe micro domain. Um, and, and, and sort of it kind of gives you sort of ideas of sort of the beginnings of kind of um, that, that kind of, um, uh, I think, um, you know, genome organization. But I think it's really going to be important to sort of um, um, integrate the protein, protein type liquid, liquid transitions on a semi-solid, effectively long, you know, chromosomal-like, you know, array, array, as opposed to short nucleosomal arrays, because, you know, that's a short polymer. That has a totally different property to a genome level uh, uh, sort of um, chromosome, right? And, and chromosome territory. Good thank you. And we have a question here. Uh, a more technical question for Dr. Osha. What is your take on the fighting between the labeling and the precision of imaging. So let, let me be more specific. An antibody plus second antibody plus fluorescence protein adds up to 30 nan nanometers. Mm -hmm. We want to image a histone protein. Considering the uncertainty of rotation, flexibility, stretching, flexibility, the fluorescence particle is far away, can be far away. Right. Um, so based on the labeling, we perform nano domain analysis. We perform contact analysis. Are they reflecting the truth? Or because everything is, is statistical based, it actually be okay. Yeah, so yeah, no, so this is a great question. And again, Gary will remember the arguments between people, the fish experiments and sort of the IC where, you know, people told, oh, you should do the fish experiment. I mean, I'm going, actually, I think the fish experiment is good. So, so to your point is that I think that um, fluorescence microscopy, right, and, and even just, even, even with super resolution down to the point spread function and the rotational, I think you can get a general location localization. You can get a, you can build general trajectories, right? Um, and the size away, yes, I mean, I think this is a big point is that when you start to put together um, an antibody, right, it's basically like 17 nanometers basically between each FAB and you start to build these up, you may actually end up getting exclusion of antibodies and certain things from certain you know, domains if they're fixed, especially sort of in fixed. So again, you know, I sound like a broken record, but this is again where I go, it's not one or the other, it's not this is better, it's that I have more confidence if two different techniques, right? Like Manochia, Storm, give me the same result, right? Because 
because, you know, and, and sometimes each might have a strength or a weakness, but I would hope they would converge on the central biology, right? Um, where live imaging might sort of uh, uh, suggest general kind of diffusion dynamics, and maybe that's important in interpreting some antibody fixation experiments about what's excluded or what's not, right? And even then, if we think about single molecule sort of um, resolution experiments, here the issue is that we build models based on, you know, very, very uh, tiny amount of particles, um, and we imagine what might be there, but we don't actually know because we can only label two things, right? So I think that, again, it's the integration, right, of using sort of um, high resolution antibodies. So there you can look at post translation modifications, which can be incredibly important. But being open to the possibility, that, uh, again, that um, it's not that the data is wrong, but that there may be an alternative hypothesis that should be acknowledged or potentially, um, if possible, excluded or confirmed with uh, a, a, another technique, right? That's how generally I would think about um, approaching, right? Every single technique, there is not a single one that doesn't have its own limitations. But can we bring together more than one technique uh, uh, um, that might either array with the same answer or a different one? Because that's oh, really because different. Right. It's not, don't think about it as wrong or right. Um, be curious, because sometimes actually the things that I thought were wrong were the most interesting. So, 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 to answer your question, obviously, with the precision. So, what's interesting with the fire nano, that's what we were doing at the end with that is we have a one nanometer, it's about 12 nanometers particle, right? Um, and you can actually build in, that's what I was building in the structure of RNA polymers. I could see the gap between the DNA. So there we can completely build it in. And so um, again, if you, you, can, you can kind of use that kind of approach to really get at what you're doing if you start to use tomography in these pieces, right? With fluorescence. And, uh, to give us some time, we just take one last quick question. We'll have more opportunities to ask uh, questions later in the day because we'll have another panel. Uh, uh, thank all three of you. Those were amazing talks. Um, I, my question is, you know, a lot of us here are engineers and like physicists and biologists, but how do you communicate kind of the physics-based principles to clinicians and people who are interacting with patients and like what kind of um, ways uh, does our understanding of like, physics translate up into like human biology and how, how have you kind of experienced that? <laughs> Loaded question, I'm sorry. I, I'm, no, I think it's a, it's a really good question. I, I can't- Some physicians here. <laughs> that What's that? <laughs> there are some physicians in the audience. <laughs> so I, I can't speak to how to communicate with clinicians other than um, <laughs> what I've learned is, is my, my younger brother, who's a MD, PhD, is, is he's incredibly useful to have when you have to go to the hospital. <laughs> um, but no, I think, you know, for me, uh, the, all that I'll say to that is, is I have had a lot of experience trying to do integration. Um, I don't even do computational biology. I don't know how to do bioinformatics, but, and again, going into, going into exploring the physics side of things is that it really boils down. So in both of the, all of these cases, there's been numerous ones, it's boiled down to communication and, and, and learning how to, you know, really understand what the needs are of that other person that you're communicating with and vice versa, right? So, you know, and so basically the bottom line is you need the right kind of people who are willing to step back and say, okay, I'm a physicist, you know, I really wanna focus on the man, but I am willing to spend the time to explain to you in English or whatever language you use, you know, what this means in a larger context and vice versa. The physicists that I collaborate with don't care about the proteins, <laughs> right? I mean, they, I, they do in a way, but they really don't wanna know all the details that I have up here about how chromosomes, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, both of us have to be willing to, to step back and, and, and communicate in a way that's effective. Um, and, and I think that that's actually really hard. And it's not something that everybody can do. So that's, I, you know, I can't really speak to, to what works for clinicians. I think clinicians need it, but I think it, as with everything else, it likely boils down to who it is you're talking to and are they willing to engage at that 
at that level, which is which is very difficult. You have to learn each other's vocabulary. You have to, you know, spend time. It took. I did a sabbatical with Sam back in 2017, and it's just now that we're finally getting a paper together. I mean, you know, it, it just it just takes time. And and okay, but that pandemic thing didn't help. But well, th thank you so much. And and again, I know there are a few a uh, few more questions we have here, but we'll have another chance. We'll have another panel later in the afternoon. Uh, thank you so much.